I need you at the wall, the governor explains under his breath to Martinez, motioning at all the carnage on the ground. Cleaning off all the biters they no doubt drug with them. Martinez keeps nodding. Yes, sir, governor. I didn't know you'd be coming out to get them when we gave word of their arrival. They're all yours. The governor turns to the strangers. A big smile here. Follow me, folks. I'll give you the nickel tour. Chapter 8 Austin gets to the arena early that night, around 8.45, and sits alone, down front, behind the rusted cyclone fence barrier on the end of the second row, thinking about Lily. He wonders if he should have pushed harder to get her to come along with him tonight. He thinks about that look she gave him earlier that evening, the softness that crossed her hazel eyes right before she kissed him, and he feels a strange mixture of excitement and panic burning in his gut. The great tungsten spotlights boom to life around the stadium, illuminating the dirt strip and littered infield, and the stands slowly fill up around Austin with noisy townspeople hungry for blood and catharsis. The air has the snap of a chill in it and reeks of fuel oil and walker rot, and Austin feels weirdly removed from it all. Clad in a hoodie, jeans, and motorcycle boots, his long hair pulled back in a leather stay. He fidgets on the cold, hard seat, his muscles sore from the afternoon's adventures in the hinterlands. He can't get comfortable. He gazes out across the infield at the far side of the arena and sees the dark portals filling with clusters of upright corpses, each leashed to a handler by thick chains. The handlers start leading the biters out into the jarring light of the infield, the silver follow spots making the dead faces look almost kabuki-like, painted like morbid clowns. The crowd simmers with noise and cat calls and clapping. The phlegmy growling and moaning of the walkers as they take their places on the gravel warning track blends with the rising voices of the spectators to create an unearthly din. Austin stares at the spectacle. He can't get Lily out of his head. The roar that's building all around him begins to fade, and fade, and fade away, until all he can hear in his head is Lily's voice softly making a promise. I'll show you some things. The only way we're going to survive? Helping each other. Something pokes Austin in the ribs and yanks him back to reality. He jerks around and realizes an old man is taking a seat right next to him. Sporting a nicotine-yellowed beard, an ancient face as wrinkled as wadded parchment, and a tattered black overcoat and wide-brimmed hat, he's a feisty old Hasidic Jew who somehow managed to survive the streets of Atlanta after the turn. His name is Saul, and he shows Austin his stained, rotting teeth as he says with a smile, Gonna be a hot time in the old town tonight, am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Austin feels dizzy, lightheaded. Can't wait. Austin turns back to the gathering of dead on the track's periphery, and the sight of it makes him feel sick to his stomach. One of the biters, an obese male in bile-spattered painter's overalls, sprouts a knot of small intestines from a sucking wound in his porcine belly. Another one is missing the side of her face, her upper teeth gleaming in the spotlights as she moans and tugs on her chain. Austin is quickly losing his enthusiasm for the fights. Lily has a point. He looks down at the sticky tread beneath the bench, the cigarette butts and puddles of soft drinks and stale beer. He closes his eyes and thinks of Lily's sweet face. The spray of freckles across the bridge of her nose, the slender curve of her neck. Excuse me he says, standing up and pushing himself past the old man. Better hurry back, the geezer mumbles, blinking fitfully. Show's gonna start lickety-split. Austin's already halfway down the aisle. He doesn't look back. On his way across town, moving past the shadows of storefronts and the dark-boarded buildings of the main drag, Austin sees a half-dozen people coming toward him on the opposite side of the street. Pulling his hoodie tighter, Thrusting his hands in his pockets, he keeps moving, his head down. Avoiding eye contact with the oncoming group, he recognizes the governor, who walks out in front of three strangers like a tour guide, his chest all puffed up with pride. Bruce and Gabe bring up the rear with assault rifles cradled and ready. 
Guard station about a mile away, completely abandoned, the governor is saying to the strangers. Austin has never seen these people before. The governor is treating them like VIPs. All kind of supplies left inside, the governor is saying. They're making good use of it. Night vision goggles, sniper rifles, ammo, you seen it in action. This place wouldn't be shit without it. As Austin passes on the opposite sidewalk, he gets a better glimpse of the newcomers. The two men and one woman look battle-scarred, somber, and maybe even a little nervous. Of the two men, each of whom is clad in riot gear, the older one looks tougher, meaner, more cunning. Sandy-haired with a grizzle of a beard, the older man walks alongside the governor, and Austin hears him say, You sound lucky. Where is it you're taking us? We're walking toward the light. What is that, a baseball game? Before they vanish around the corner, Austin glances over his shoulder and gets a better look at the other two strangers. The younger man wears a riot helmet and looks maybe Asian, his age hard to tell at this distance and in this light. The woman is far more interesting to look at. Her lean, sculpted face barely visible within the shadow of her hooded garment. She looks to Austin to be in her mid-thirties, African-American, dour, and exotically beautiful. Just for an instant, Austin has a bad feeling about these people. Well, stranger, he hears the governor saying as they pass out of view. It looks like we're not the only ones lucky around here. You showed up on the perfect night. There's a fight tonight. The wind and the shadows drown the rest of the conversation as the group rounds the corner. Austin lets out a sigh, shakes off the inexplicable feeling of dread, and continues on toward Lily's place. A minute later, he finds himself standing in front of Lily's building. The wind is picked up, and litter swirls across the threshold. Austin pauses, lowers his hood, brushes a strand of curly hair from his eyes, and silently rehearses what he wants to say. He goes up to her door and takes a deep breath. Lily sits by her window in a cast-off armchair, a candle flickering on a side table next to her, a paperback cookbook open to the chapter on great southern side dishes, when the sound of knocking interrupts her reverie. She had been thinking about Josh Hamilton, and all the great meals he would have prepared had he survived, and the mixture of sorrow and regret drove away Lily's hunger for something better than canned meat and instant rice. She had also been thinking a lot that night about the governor, Lately, Lily's fear of the man has been morphing into something else. She can't get the memory out of her head of the governor sentencing Josh's killer, the town butcher, to a horrible death at the hands of hungry walkers. With a combination of shame and satisfaction, Lily keeps reliving the act of vengeance in her darkest thoughts. The man got what he deserved. And perhaps, just perhaps... The governor is the only redress they have to these kinds of injustices. An eye for an eye. Who the hell? She grumbles, levering herself out of her chair. She crosses the room on bare feet, her ripped bell-bottom jeans dragging on the filthy hardwood. She wears an olive green thermal underwear top deftly ripped at the neck in a perfect V, a sports bra underneath, raw hide necklaces and beads around her slender neck. Her flaxen locks are pulled back in a loose Bridget Bardot parfait on the top of her head. Her funky sense of fashion, first developed in the thrift shops and Salvation Army stores of Marietta, has died hard in the post-plague world. In a way, her sense of style is her armor, her defense mechanism. She opens the door and looks out at Austin standing in the dark. Sorry to keep bothering you, he says sheepishly one arm holding the other as though he's about to break apart at the seams. He has his hoodie drawn tight around his narrow face, and for the briefest instant, he looks like a different person to Lily. His eyes have lost the arrogant swagger that perpetually gleams there. His expression has softened, and the real person underneath the hard shell has emerged. He levels his gaze at her. Are you in the middle of something? She proffers a smile. Yeah, he caught me on the phone with my stockbroker, moving my millions around all my offshore hedge funds. Should I come back? Lily sighs. 
It's called a joke, Austin. Remember humor? He nods sadly. Oh. Right. He manages a smile. I'm a little slow tonight. What can I do for you? Okay, um... He looks around the dark street. Practically the entire town is relocated to the arena for the night's festivities. Now the wind scrapes trash along the deserted sidewalks and rustles in the defunct power lines, making an eerie humming noise. Only a few of Martinez's men remain at the corners of the barricades, patrolling with their AR-15s and binoculars. Every now and then a searchlight sweeps its silver beam across the neighboring woods. I was wondering, um... You know, if you're not too busy, he stammers, avoiding eye contact with her. If you might be willing to, like, do a little training tonight. She looks askance at him. Training? He clears his throat awkwardly, looks down. Uh, uh, what I mean is, you said you might consider showing me some things. Giving me some pointers on how to, you know deal with the biters, protect myself. She looks at him, and she takes a deep breath. Then she smiles. Give me a second. I'll get my guns. They go down by the train station on the eastern edge of town, as far away from the lights and noise of the arena as they can get. By the time they get there, Lily has turned the collar up on her denim jacket to ward off the gathering chill. The air smells of methane and swamp gas, a melange of rot, and the odor braces them in the moonlit shadows of the train yard. Lily runs Austin through a few scenarios, quizzes him, challenges him. Austin has his 9 millimeter Glock with him, as well as a buck knife sheathed on his right thigh, tied with rawhide. Come on, keep moving, she says to him at one point, as he slowly inches his way along the threshold of the woods, his pistol at his side, gripped in his right hand, his finger outside the trigger pad. They've been at it for almost an hour now, and Austin is getting restless. The forest pulses and drones with night noises, crickets, rustling branches, and the constant thread of shadows moving behind the trees. Lily walks alongside him with the quiet authority of a drill instructor. You always want to keep moving, but not too fast and not too slow. Just keep your eyes open. Let me guess. Like this, right? He says, a trace of exasperation in his voice. His gun is one of Lily's silencers attached to the muzzle. His hoodie is pulled tight around his face. A high chain link fence runs along the woods, once serving as security for the railroad depot. A cinder strewn trail runs along a row of derelict railroad tracks overgrown with prairie grass. I told you to pull your hood down, she says. You're cutting off your peripheral vision. He does so and keeps moving along the tree line. How's this? Better. You always want to know your surroundings. That's the key. It's more important than what weapon you're using or how you're holding your gun or your axe or whatever. Always be aware of what's on either side of you and what's behind you so you can make a fast getaway if necessary. I get it. And never, ever, ever, ever let yourself get surrounded. They're slow, but they can hoard in on you if there are enough of them. You said that already. The point is, you always know which way to run if you have to. Remember, you're always going to be faster than they are, but that doesn't mean you can't get penned in. Austin nods and gazes intermittently over his shoulder, keeping track of the darkness on all sides of the trail. He turns and slowly backs along the trail for a moment, searching the shadows. Lily watches him. Put your gun away for a second, she says. Grab your knife. She watches him switch weapons. Okay, now let's say you're out of ammo. You're isolated, maybe lost. He gives her a sidelong glance. Lily, we've been through this part, like twice already. That's good, you can count. Come on, and we're gonna go through it again, a third time, so answer the question. How do you hold your knife? He sighs, backing along the trees, his boots crunching in the cinders. You hold it blade down, a tight grip on the hilt. I'm not stupid, Lily. I never said you were stupid. Tell me why you hold your knife like that. 
He keeps backing along the edge of the woods, moving absently now, shaking his head. You hold it like that because you got one chance to bring it down hard on their skull and you want to do it decisively. Lily notices a stray timber, a piece of creosote-soaked railroad tie, lying beside the trail about twenty feet away. She silently moves toward it. Go on, she says. With one quick, discreet movement, she kicks the timber across Austin's path. Why do you do it decisively? He lets out another weary sigh, blithely backing along. Uh, you do it decisively because you got one chance to destroy the brain. He keeps backing slowly toward the timber, gripping the knife, unaware of the obstruction lying across his path. I'm not an idiot, Lily. She grins. Oh no, you're a regular ninja. The way you were clearing the woods for us today at the crash site, you got it all going on. I'm not afraid, Lily. I've told you a million times, I've been around. He trips on the railroad tie. Ow, fuck! He blurts when he hits the ground, raising a puff of cinder dust. At first, Lily lets out a blurt of laughter as Austin sits there for a second, looking defeated, embarrassed, humiliated. In the darkness, his eyes shimmer with emotion, and his curls dangle in his face. He looks like a whipped dog. Lily's laughter dies, and guilt twinges in her gut. I'm sorry, sorry, she murmurs, kneeling by him. I didn't mean to. She strokes his shoulder. I'm sorry, I'm being an asshole. It's okay, he says softly, taking deep breaths, looking down. I deserve it. No, no. She sits down next to him. You don't deserve any of this. He looks at her. Don't worry about it. You're just trying to help me and I appreciate it. I don't know what I'm doing half the time. She rubs her face. All I know is we gotta be ready. We gotta be... I hate to say it, but we gotta be as fucking bloodthirsty as the biters. She looks at him. It's the only way we're gonna get through this. His gaze locks onto hers. The ambient drone deepens around them, the roar of night sounds rising. In the distance, barely audible, come the hyena howls of the dirt track spectators cheering for blood. At last, Austin says, You're starting to sound like the governor. Lily gazes into the distance and says nothing, just listens to the sounds drifting on the breeze. Austin licks his lips and looks at her. Lily, I've been thinking. What if there's no other side to get through to? What if this is it? What if this is all there is for us? Lily thinks about it. It doesn't matter. As long as we have each other, and we're willing to do what it takes, we'll survive. The words hang in the night air for a moment. Almost imperceptibly, they have come closer together, Lily's hand lingering on his shoulder, his hand finding the small of her back. Lily realizes all at once that she might have originally been thinking about the whole community sticking together, but now she's thinking only about Austin and her. She finds herself leaning in closer to him, and he responds by leaning toward her. She senses something unraveling, a letting go, and their lips coming together and the kiss about to happen when suddenly Lily draws back. What's this? Jesus, what's this? She feels something wet down around his waist and she looks down. The bottom hem of his sweatshirt is soaked in blood. Some of it drips and runnels onto the leafy ground as black and shiny as axle oil. The knife blade sticks out of a tear in his denims where it sliced through the flesh of his hip in the fall. Austin puts his hand over it. Shit. He utters through gritted teeth, the blood seeping through his fingers. I thought I felt something bite me. Come on. Lily springs to her feet and gives him a hand, carefully hoisting him to his feet. We gotta get you to Dr. Stevens. Her full name was Christina Meredith Haben, and she grew up in Kirkwood, Georgia, and she went away to college in the 1980s to study telecommunications at Oberlin. She had a child out of wedlock that she carried to term, and then gave up for adoption on the day after 9-11. She'd suffered through a series of romantic misadventures in her life, never found Mr. Wright, never married, and always considered herself wed to her job as the senior segment producer at one of the biggest stations in the South. 
She had won three Emmys, a Clio, and a couple of Cable Ace Awards, all of which made her justifiably proud. And she never felt her superiors respected her or provided her with the remuneration that she deserved. But at the present moment, on this filthy tile floor in the glare of fluorescent lights, all of Christina Haben's regrets, fears, frustrations, hopes, and desires are long gone, vanquished by death. Her remains lying scattered across the gore-spattered parquet, while seventeen captive walkers tear into her organs and tissues. The watery, orgiastic eating noises bounce around the cinder block walls, as the dead feast on mostly unidentifiable body parts that used to comprise Christina Haben. Blood and spinal fluid and bile mingle in the corners of the room like multicolored cordials, sluicing through the seams in the tile, splashing the walls in blooms of deep scarlet, and drenching the frenzied biters. Selected for their physical integrity, earmarked for the gladiatorial arena, most of these creatures appear to be former adult males, some of them now crouching ape-like in the bright light, gnawing on gristly nodules that used to belong to Christina Haben's lower skeleton. Across the room, a pair of rectangular portal windows are embedded in a garage door that encloses the room. Within the frame of the window on the left, a gaunt, weathered, mustachioed face peers in at the action. Standing in the silent corridor outside the enclosure, gazing intently through the window glass, the governor registers little emotion on his face, other than stern satisfaction with what he is seeing. His left ear is bandaged from a recent encounter with the newcomers, and the pain braces him. It makes him clench his fists. It courses down his marrow like electricity, girding him, crystallizing his mission. All his doubt, all his second guessing, in fact, all his remaining humanity, are being pushed aside by the rage and the vengeance and the voice deep within him that serves as a compass. He knows now the only way to keep this tinderbox from going up in flames. He knows what he must do now in order to. The shuffling of footsteps from the opposite end of the corridor interrupts his thoughts. Lily has her arm around Austin as she reaches the bottom of the stairs, turns a corner, and hurries down the main corridor that cuts through the foul-smelling cinder block catacombs of garages and service bays beneath the arena. At first, she doesn't see the dark figure standing alone at the far end of the corridor, gazing through the portal window. She's too preoccupied with Austin's injury, and the effort required just to keep pressure on the wound with the right hand as she shuffles along toward the infirmary. Look what the cat dragged in, the figure says as Lily and Austin approach. Oh. Hey, Lily says awkwardly as she shuffles up with Austin, dripping a few blood droplets on the floor. Nothing life-threatening, but enough to be worrisome. Gotta get this one to the doctor. I hope the other guy looks worse, the governor jokes as Lily and Austin pause outside the battered garage door. Austin manages a smirk, his long, damp curls hanging in his face. It's nothing, just a flesh wound. It fell on my knife like an idiot. He holds his side. Bleeding's basically stopped. Totally okay now. Very faintly, the muffled noises of the feeding frenzy can be heard through the sealed glass. It sounds like an immense stomach growling. Lily gets a glimpse through the nearest window of the gruesome orgy going on in the pen, and she glances at Austin, who sees it too. They say nothing. The sight of it barely registers to Lily. Once upon a time, she would have been repulsed. She glances back at the governor. They're getting their vitamins and minerals, I see. Nothing is wasted around here, the governor says with a shrug, nodding toward the window. Poor gal from the helicopter up and died on us. Internal injuries from the crash, I guess. Poor thing. He turns toward the glass and looks in. She and the pilot are serving a larger purpose now. Lily sees the bandaged deer. She shoots another glass at Austin, who also stares at the governor's blood-spotted bandage and the mangled ear underneath. It's none of my business, Austin says finally, pointing at the ear. But are you okay? Looks like you got a nasty wound yourself. Them new people. Came in tonight, the governor murmurs, not taking his gaze off the window. Turned out to be more of a liability than I first thought. 
Yeah, I saw you with them earlier. Austin perks up. You were kind of taking them on a tour of the place, right? What happened? The governor turns and looks directly at Lily as though she asked the question. I try to extend every courtesy to people. Show them hospitality. We're all in the same boat these days, am I right? Lily gives him a nod. Absolutely, yeah. So what was their problem? Turns out they were a scouting party from another settlement somewhere nearby, and their intentions were not exactly neighborly. What did they do? The governor stares at her. My guess is they were going to try and raid us. Raid us? It's happening all over the place now. Scouts slip in, secure a place. They take everything, food, water, the shirt off your back. So what happened? Got into a major tussle with them. I wasn't going to let them fuck with us, not in a million years. One of them, the colored girl, tried to chew my ear off. Lily shares another tense glance with Austin. She looks at the governor. Jesus. What is going on? These people are fucking savages. We're all savages, Lily girl. We just going to be the biggest savages on the block. He takes a deep breath. Got into it pretty bad with the main guy. The fella fought back hard. Ended up cutting his hand off. Lily can't move. She feels contrary emotions flowing through her, pinching her insides, triggering sparks of trauma in the back of her mind. Memories of a bullet destroying the back of Josh Hamilton's head. Jesus Christ, she utters, almost to herself. The governor takes another deep breath, then lets out an exasperated sigh. Ah, Stevens is keeping him alive. Maybe we'll learn something from him, maybe not. We're safe now, though, and that's what counts. Lily nods and starts to say something when the governor cuts her off. I am not gonna let anyone fuck with our town, he says, making eye contact with both of them. A single pearl of blood tracks down his neck from the bandaged ear. He wipes it away and sighs again. You people are my number one priority, and that's all there is to it. Lily swallows hard. For the first time since she came to this place, she feels something other than contempt for this man. If not trust, then maybe a scintilla of sympathy. Anyway, she says, I better get Austin to the infirmary. Go on, the governor says with a weary smile. Get gorgeous George here a band-aid. Lily puts her arm around Austin and helps the young man shuffle down the corridor. But before they turn the far corner, Lily pauses and looks back at Philip. Hey, Governor, she says softly. Thank you. On their way through the maze of corridors leading to the infirmary, they run into Bruce. The big African-American is coming in the opposite direction, striding along with purpose, his jack boots echoing, his forty-five bouncing on his big muscular thigh, his face burning with urgency. He glances up when he sees Lily and Austin. Hey, guys, he says in his tense baritone. You two seen the governor around here? Lily tells him where the man is and then adds, Must be a full moon tonight, huh? Bruce looks at her, his expression taut, his eyes narrowing. He looks as though he's wondering just exactly how much she knows. What do you mean? She shrugs. It just seems like things are getting crazier by the minute. How do you mean? <laughs> I don't know. These assholes trying to raid us. People acting crazy and stuff. He looks relieved. Yeah. Right. It's some crazy shit. I gotta go. He brushes past them and hurries on down the hall toward the walker pens. Lily furrows her brow, watching him. Something isn't adding up. Chapter 9 When they get to the infirmary, Lily and Austin find Dr. Stevens preoccupied, hunched over the partially nude form of an unconscious adult male sprawled on a gurney in the corner. The man, thirty-ish, fit, sandy-haired, a grizzle of a beard, has a towel thrown across his privates, and a blood-sodden bandage on his right stump of a wrist. The doctor is carefully removing battered, blood-stippled body armor from the man's shoulders. 
Doc? Got another patient for you? Lily says as she crosses the room with Austin shuffling alongside her. The unconscious man on the gurney is unknown to Lily, but Austin seems to recognize the sandy-haired man immediately and gives Lily a poke in the ribs. Austin whispers, It's him. The dude the governor tangled with. What now? The doctor says, glancing up from the gurney and looking at them over the tops of his wire-rimmed glasses. He sees Austin's fingers stained in blood, pressing against his ribs. Put him over there, I'll be right with you. The doctor glances over his shoulder. Alice, give us a hand with Austin, will you? The nurse comes out of an adjacent storage room with an armful of cotton bandages, medical tape, and gauze. Dressed in her lab coat, hair pulled back from her youthful face, she looks frazzled. She makes eye contact with Lily, but says nothing as she hurries across the room. Lily helps Austin over to an examination table in the opposite corner. Who's the patient, Doc? Lily asks, playing dumb, gently helping Austin hop onto the edge of the table. Austin cringes slightly at a twinge of pain, but seems more fascinated by the man lying out cold on the gurney across the room. Alice comes over and begins to gingerly unzip Austin's sweatshirt, inspecting the wound. Across the room, the doctor carefully pulls a threadbare hospital smock over the grizzled man's lolling head, guiding his limp arms into sleeves. I think I heard somebody say his name is Rick, but I'm not positive about that. Lily walks over to the gurney and gazes distastefully down at the unconscious man. What I heard is that he attacked the governor. The doctor doesn't look at her. He simply purses his lips skeptically as he gently ties the back of the gown. And where, pray tell, did you hear this? From the man himself. The doctor smiles ruefully. That's what I thought. He shoots her a glance. You think he's giving you the straight scoop, do you? What do you mean? Lily comes closer. She looks down at the man on the gurney. In the blank-faced stupor of sleep, his mouth slightly parted and emitting shallow breaths, the sandy-haired man could be anybody. Butcher, baker, candlestick maker, serial killer, saint. Anybody. Why would the governor lie about this? What good would it do? The doctor finishes tying off the back of the smock and then gently pulls a sheet over the patient. You seem to have forgotten your fearless leader is a congenital liar. Stephen says this in a casual tone, as though imparting the time and temperature. He stands and faces Lily. It's old news, Lily. Look up the word sociopath and see if you don't find his picture. Look. I know he's no Mother Teresa, but what if he's exactly what we need now? The doctor looks at her. What we need? Really? He's what we need? Stephen shakes his head, turns away from her, and goes over to the pulse ox monitor on a table next to the gurney. The machine is off, its screen blank. Hooked to a 12-volt car battery, it looks as though it's fallen off the back of a truck, Stevens fiddles with it for a moment, readjusts the terminals. You know what we really need? We need a monitor down here that actually works. We have to stick together, Lily persists. These people are a threat. The doctor whirls angrily toward her. When did you drink the Kool-Aid, Lily? You once told me it's the governor who's the biggest threat to our safety, you remember? What happened to the freedom fighter? Lily narrows her eyes at him. The room goes still, Alice and Austin feeling the tension, their silence fueling the awkward edge to the atmosphere. Lily says, He could have killed us back then, and he didn't. I just want to survive. What is this thing you have for him? This thing I have is lying right here, the doctor says, indicating the unconscious man. I believe the governor attacked him. What are you talking about? The doctor nods. Without provocation, I'm talking about. The governor mutilated this man. That's ridiculous. The doctor ponders her. His tone of voice changes, lowers, goes cold. What happened to you? Like I said, Doc, I'm just trying to survive. Use your head, Lily. Why would these people traipse in here with bad intentions? They're just groping around like the rest of us. He looks down at the man on the gurney. 
The man's eyes jerk slightly under his lids, a desperate fever dream unfolding. His breathing gets a little frenzied for a moment, then calms again. The silence stretches. At last, Austin speaks up from the other side of the room. Doc, there were two others, a younger guy and a woman with him. Do you know where they are, where they went? Stevens just shakes his head, looking at the floor now. His voice comes out in barely a whisper. I don't know. Then he looks up at Lily. But I'll tell you this much. I wouldn't want to be them right now. A muffled voice can be heard coming from behind a sealed garage door at the end of a lonely corridor in the arena's sub-basement. Hoarse with exhaustion, stretched thin with nervous tension, the voice is feminine, low, and indecipherable to the two men standing outside the door. She's been at it ever since I put her in there, Bruce says to the governor, who stands facing the door with arms folded judiciously across his chest. Talking to herself like that. Interesting, the governor comments, his senses sharpened by the latent violence in the air. He can feel the rumble of generators in his bones. He can detect the odors of decay and plaster rotting. These people are fucking crazy, Bruce adds, shaking his glistening bald head, his hand instinctively resting on the grip of the three fifty seven holstered on his hip. Yeah, crazy like foxes, the governor murmurs. His ear throbs. His skin tingles with anticipation. Control. The refrain bubbles up from the voice that lives in the lowest compartment of his brain. Women are meant to be controlled. Managed. Broken. For one fleeting instant, it feels to Philip Blake as though part of him is outside his body, watching all this transpire. Fascinated by the voice within him that is second nature now, a second skin. You have to find out what these people know, where they come from, what they have, and most importantly, how dangerous they are. That lady in there is tough as shit, Bruce says. She ain't gonna give anything up. I know how to break her, the governor mutters. Leave it to me. He breathes deeply, inhaling slowly, preparing himself. He senses danger here. These people could very easily hurt him. They could tear apart his community, and so he must call on that part of him that knows how to hurt others, knows how to break people, knows how to control women. He doesn't even blink. He simply turns to Bruce and says, Open it. The garage door rolls up on rusty, shrieking casters banging against the top rail, at the rear of the enclosure, the woman in the darkness jerks against her ropes with a start, her long dreadlocks matted to her face. I'm sorry, the governor says to her. Don't let me interrupt. In the slice of light coming from the corridor, the woman's left eye shimmers through a gap in her braids, just that one eye, balefully taking in the visitors standing like giants in the doorway silhouetted by the bare bulbs and cages along the hallway ceiling behind them. The governor takes a step closer. Bruce comes in behind him. You seem to be having a nice spirited conversation with... I'm sorry, who exactly was it you were talking to? Actually, never mind, I don't even care. Let's get this underway. The woman on the floor brings to mind an exotic animal leashed inside a pen, dark and lithe and supple like a panther, even in her ratty work clothes, her slender neck strapped and roped to the back wall. Each arm is tied to an opposite corner of the chamber, and her espresso-colored skin gleams with perspiration, her medusa braid shiny and flowing off her shoulders and back. She glares through her hair at the wiry man who approaches her with menacing calm. Bruce, do me a favor. The governor speaks with the absent, business-like tone of a workman approaching a faulty pipe or a pothole to be filled. Take her pants off and tie one leg to that wall over there. Bruce moves in and does what he's told. The woman tenses as her pants are yanked down. Bruce does this with the brisk certainty of someone ripping a band-aid off a sore. The big man steps back and then pulls a coil of rope off his belt. He starts hog-tying one leg. And tie her other leg to that wall over there. 
the governor instructs. The woman doesn't take her gaze off the governor. She glowers through that hair, eyes so filled with hate they could spot weld steel. The governor comes closer to her. He starts to unbuckle his belt. Don't struggle too much just yet, girl. He undoes his belt and unsnaps his camo pants. You're gonna want to save your energy. The girl on the floor glares with the intensity of a black hole swallowing all matter. Every particle in the room, every molecule, every atom is being drawn toward the black void of her eyes. The governor comes closer. He feeds off her hate like a lightning rod. After you're done there, Bruce, leave us to it, the governor says, his gaze clamped down on the woman. We need the privacy. He smiles at her. And shut the door on the way out. His smile widens. Tell me something, girl. How long do you think it would take for me to ruin your life, shatter your sense of security, really fuck you up? No answer comes from the woman, only the ancient, hunched-back gaze of an animal bristling right before a fight to the death. I think half an hour could probably do it. That smile, that heavy-lidded serpentine stare. He stands only inches away from her. But really, I plan on doing this every day as often as I can. His pants are down around his ankles now. Bruce moves off toward the doors. The governor steps out of his trousers. His spine tingles. The outer door comes down as Bruce exits. The reverberation of the bang makes the woman jerk again, just slightly. The governor's voice fills the vacuum of space as the underwear comes off. This is going to be fun. Above ground, in the night air, in the stillness of the dark town. Late. Two figures walk side by side along the ramshackle storefronts. I can't wrap my head around all this shit, Austin Ballard is saying with his hands in his pockets as he strolls along the forlorn promenade. He shudders in the chill. His hood is drawn up and over his curls, the lingering dread of what he has just seen showing on his face in brief flashes as the intermittent light spills across their path. The feeding room? Lily ambles alongside him with her denim coat buttoned up to her neck. She holds herself, her arms around her midsection in some unconscious gesture of self-preservation. Yeah. That and the dude with his hand chopped off. What the fuck is going on, Lily? She starts to answer when the distant pop of large caliber gunfire echoes. The noise makes both of them jump. Martinez and his boys are still out there, burning the midnight oil, cleaning up any stray biters drawn to the wall by the earlier commotion of the racetrack arena. Business as usual, Lily says, not really believing it. You'll get used to it. Sometimes it seems like the biters are the least of our problems. Austin shivers. Do you think these people really are planning a raid? Who knows? How many more of them do you think there are? She shrugs. She can't shake the woozy feeling in her gut that something dangerous and inexorable has already started. Like a foreboding black glacier moving undetectably beneath their feet. The course of events seems to be slipping now toward some undefined horizon. And for the first time since she stumbled upon this ragtag little community... Lily Call feels a bone-deep fear that she can't even identify. I don't know, she says at last. But I feel like we can kiss any restful night's sleep goodbye for a while. To be honest, I haven't slept that great since the turn broke out. A twinge of pain from his injury makes him flinch and he holds his side as he walks. Matter of fact, I haven't slept the night through since the beginning. Now that you mention it, I haven't either. They walk a little farther in silence until Austin says, Can I ask you something? Go ahead. Are you really on board with the governor now? Lily has been asking herself the same thing. Was it a case of Stockholm Syndrome? That weird psychological phenomenon where hostages start to feel empathy and positive feelings toward their captors? Or was she projecting all her rage and pent-up emotions through the man as though he were some kind of attack dog hardwired to her id? 
All she knew was that she was scared. I know. He's a psycho, she says finally, measuring her words. Believe me, if circumstances were different, I would cross the street and walk on the other side if I saw him coming toward me. Austin looks unsatisfied, anxious, tongue-tied. So you're saying it's like the whole when the going gets tough thing or, or something like that? She looks at him. What I'm saying is this. Knowing what's out there, we could be in serious danger again. Maybe the worst danger we've been in since the town was established. She thinks about it. I guess I see the governor as, I don't know, like fighting fire with fire? Then she adds a little softer, a little less sure of herself. As long as he's on our side... Another distant crackling volley of gunfire makes both of them twitch. They come to the end of the main drag, where two streets intersect in the darkness with a petrified railroad crossing. In the dark of night, the broken-down street sign and shoulder-high weeds look like the end of the world. Lily pauses, preparing to go her separate way to her apartment building to the north. Okay, well... Anyway... Austin looks as though he doesn't know what to do with his hands. Here's to another sleepless night. She gives him a weary grin. Tell you what, why don't you come over to my place and you can bore me some more with your tales of surfing off the coast of Panama City Beach. Hell, maybe you'll be boring enough to put me to sleep. For a moment, Austin Ballard looks like a thorn has just been removed from his paw. They settle down for the night in Lily's makeshift living room amid the cardboard boxes and carpet remnants and useless things left behind by nameless former residents. Lily makes them some instant coffee on a chafing dish, and they sit in the lantern light and just talk. They talk about their childhoods, how they share similar innocuous suburban backgrounds full of cul-de-sacs and scout troops and weenie roasts. And then they have that patented post-turn discussion of what they'll do if and when the cure comes, and the troubles go away. Austin says he'll probably look to move somewhere warm and find a good woman and settle down and build surfboards or something. Lily tells him about her dreams of being a clothing designer, and going to New York, as though New York still exists, and making a name for herself. Lily finds herself growing more and more fond of this shaggy, good-natured young man. She marvels that he's such a decent, gentle person underneath the swagger, she wonders if the Playboy routine wasn't some kind of messed-up defense mechanism. Or maybe he's just dealing with the same thing every other survivor is dealing with right now. The thing nobody can put a name to, but feels like some kind of virulent stress disorder. Regardless of her epiphanies about Austin, however, Lily is glad for the company that night, and they talk into the wee hours. At one point, very late that night, after a long moment of awkward silence... Lily looks around her dark apartment, thinking, trying to remember where she put her little stash of hooch. You know what, she says at last. If memory serves, I think I have a half a bottle of Southern Comfort hidden away for emergencies. Austin gives her a loaded glance. You sure you want to part with it? She shrugs, getting up off the couch and padding across the room to a stack of crates. No time like the present. She mutters, rifling through the extra blankets, bottled water, ammunition, band-aids, and disinfectant. Hello, gorgeous, she says finally, locating the beautifully etched bottle of tea-colored liquid. She comes back and thumbs off the cap. Here's to a good night's sleep, she toasts, and then knocks back a healthy swig, wiping her lips. She sits down on the sofa next to him and hands the bottle over. Austin, who cringes again from the pain in his side, takes a pull off the bottle and then grimaces from the burn in his throat as well as the stitch in his rib cage. Uh, Jesus, I'm such a goddamn pussy. What are you talking about? You're not a pussy. Young guy your age, going on runs, kicking ass outside the safe zone. She takes the bottle and slugs down another gulp. You're gonna be fine. He gives her a look. Young guy? 
What are you, a senior citizen? I'm almost 23 years old, Lily. He grins. Give me that thing. He takes the bottle and swallows another gulp, shuddering at the burn. He coughs and holds his side. <laughs> Fuck! <coughs> she stifles a giggle. You all right? You need some water? No? She takes the bottle from him and takes another sip. Truth is, I'm old enough to be your... older sister. She belches. Then she giggles, covering her mouth. Jesus Christ, excuse me. He laughs. The pain surges up his ribcage again and he flinches. They drink and talk for a while, until Austin starts coughing again, holding his side. You okay? She reaches over and moves a lock of his curly hair out of his eyes. You want some Tylenol? I'm fine, he snaps at her. Then he lets out a pained sigh. Ah, I'm sorry. Thank you for the offer, but I'm good. He reaches up and touches her hand. I'm sorry I'm being so... cranky. I feel like an idiot, like a fucking invalid. How could I be so fucking clumsy? She looks at him. Would you shut up? You're not clumsy and you're not an invalid. He looks at her. Thanks. He touches her hand. I appreciate it. For a moment, Lily feels the darkness around her shifting and spinning. She feels a loosening in her midsection, a warmth flowing down through her from her tummy all the way to her toes. She wants to kiss him. She might as well face it. She wants to kiss him a lot. She wants to prove to him he's not a pussy. He's a good, strong, virile, decent man. But something holds her back. She's not good at this. She's no prude. She's had plenty of men. But she can't bring herself to do it. Instead, she just looks at him. And the look on her face apparently sends a signal to him that something interesting is going on. His smile fades. He touches her face. She licks her lips, pondering the situation, wanting so badly to grab him and suck his face. At last, breaking the tension, he says, You gonna hog that bottle the rest of the night? She grins and hands it over, and he downs a huge series of gulps, polishing off a major portion of the remaining booze. This time, he doesn't cringe. He doesn't flinch. He just looks at her and says, I think I should warn you about something. His big brown eyes fill with embarrassment, regret, and maybe even a little shame. I don't have a condom. It starts with drunken laughter. Lily roars with belly-deep guffaws. She hasn't laughed this hard since the outbreak of the plague. And she doubles over with chortling, honking laughter until her sides ache and her eyes begin to glaze over with tears. Austin can't help joining in, and he laughs and laughs until he realizes Lily has grabbed him by the front of his hoodie, and she says something about not giving a flying fuck about condoms, and before they even know what's happening, she's yanked his face toward hers and their lips have locked onto each other. The liquor-fueled passion erupts. They wrap themselves around each other and they start making out so vigorously, they knock over the bottle and the lamp next to the couch and the stack of books that Lily was meaning to read at some point. Austin slips off the edge of the sofa and slams onto the floor, and Lily tackles him, sticking her tongue into his mouth. She tastes the sweet liquor on his breath and spicy musk of his scent, and she burrows between his legs. They bathe in the heat flowing off each other, the latent desire repressed for so many months, and they go at it for many minutes there on the floor. She feels Austin caressing the curve of her breasts under her top and the softness of her hips and the sweet spot between her legs and she moistens and begins breathing hard and fast, flushed with excitement. At last, she realizes that he's cringing from the pain in his side again, and she sees the bandage where his hoodie had been wrenched up toward his chest, and she pulls back. The sight of it breaks her heart. She feels responsible for it, and now she wants so badly to make it all better. Come here, she says, taking his hand and lifting him back onto the couch. Watch me. She whispers to him as he flops down on the sofa, out of breath. Just watch. She takes off her clothes, one piece at a time, not taking her eyes off him. 
He already has his hands on his belt, unbuckling it. She slips out of her top, gazing at him with twinkling eyes. She takes her time. She folds each article of clothing as it comes off. Her jeans, her bra, her panties. Transfixing him, holding him wrapped until she is standing completely nude in the slice of moonlight in front of him. Her hair in her face now, her head spinning, tipsy from booze and desire. Goosebumps rash down her arms. She goes to him without another word. Not taking her eyes off him, she sits on him. He lets out a breathy, lusty sigh as she guides him into her. The feeling is extraordinary. She sees artifacts of light and sparks in her vision as she rhythmically rocks up and down. He arches his back and thrusts up into her. 